Hey everybody, Dr. R here, and welcome to topic 197 in our countdown of the 200 highest yield topics on USMLE Step 2 to CK. So let's start our discussion of testicular tumors with some basic definitions of some types of tumors. So testicular malignancy can be divided into germ cell tumors and sex cord stromal tumors. And we'll add some subcategories to this in a moment, but just note that the germ cell tumors in general make up about 95% of cases and the germ cell tumors tend to be malignant and the sex cord stromal tumors are, tend to be more benign. So in terms of your germ cell tumors, remember these are the more common ones that are more likely to be malignant. We can break them down into seminomas and non-seminomas. Now the non-seminomas tumors actually have another sub subcategory which would be the embryonal carcinoma yolk sac tumors choriocarcinoma and teratomas it's also important to note that you can have a mix of all of these different types of tumors we would just call those mixed germ cell tumors now in general the seminomas resemble more of the primordial germ cells and the early gonadocytes whereas the non seminomatous tumors can be undifferentiated they can appear as embryonic stem cells similar to what we can see in an embryonal carcinoma or they can differ differentiate into a specific type of tissue that we see more in the choriocarcinoma where you have these syncytiotrophoblastic or cytotrophoblastic type cells. In general, you can try to use the alpha fetoprotein or the AFP and uh, HCG to try to distinguish a seminoma from a non-seminoma, but in reality, this doesn't work so well because there's a lot of exceptions. And again, there's mixed tumors, so you can have both. But in general, remember this is not a hard and fast rule, but in general, one third of the cases of seminomas have elevations in the HCG and a normal AFP. So sometimes people will say that a normal AFP is commonly found in seminomas, but again, not a hard and fast rule, and it can really get tricky in a board question. The non-seminomas in general tend to have very high elevations in AFP, particularly the yolk sac tumor is notoriously known in board questions for having a high alpha fetal protein or AFP. But like we said, if the tumor is mixed, it can have both elevations in HCG and AFP. And one interesting thing to note, just to not to get confused about this, and I'll talk about this again, is that the embryonal carcinoma tumors actually have a normal AFP and have elevations in the HCG, assuming it's a pure embryonal carcinoma. So like I said, a lot of exceptions, it gets really tricky. I wouldn't hang my hat necessarily on just those lab markers, unless, like I said, if we're talking about yolk sac tumors, notoriously they have very high elevations in AFP. And the very last thing I wanna say about this is the sex cord stromal tumors, which I haven't really talked about much. Those tumors, there's actually two major ones that we'll talk about, that's the Leydig cell tumor and the Sertoli cell tumor. And like I said, these tend to be benign and we'll also review those. Testicular tumors in men generally appear between the ages of 15, 35, 40. So this is this is the range where we see most of them. But what's really interesting that this represents the majority, but there's also peaks that are outside of this range. So we have a peak in early life between infancy and four years old, where we have the highest incidence of the teratomas and yolk sac tumors. And recall that the teratomas and yolk sac tumors are the non-seminomas. So in general, in infancy to four years old, most commonly non-seminomas, particularly yolk sac tumor and teratomas. Then between 25 and 40, it can really be anything. There's a high incidence of post-puberty seminomatous tumors, as well as non-seminomas. And then once we're over 60, there is a higher incidence of a specific type of seminoma known as a spermatocytic seminoma. But the big thing that I want you to remember over 60 is going to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we'll get to that in a moment. So the biggest risk factor that is particularly high yield to remember in association with testicular cancer and tumors is going to be cryptorchidism. And recall, cryptorchidism is when one or both testes fail to descend and this tends to be the major risk factor that's commonly talked about in board questions. Also, family history is particularly important to remember in the cases of testicular cancer and tumors. And remember, your mumps or chitis can also predispose you to this due to some potential dysregulation of genetic factors from the inflammation and the damage from the, the virus early in life. The other less high yield risk factors to remember are Klinefelter syndrome, as well as a history of inguinal hernia. So in general, in terms of your general presentation, you would expect to have a painless nodule or swelling usually in one testicle again there's an exception to this non-hodgkin lymphomas can be bilateral but in general 
usually it's in one testicle and it's usually a solid firm fixed mass okay and again i want to stress the importance of the pain less like i said there's going to be a differential you have when you're thinking about testicular pathology and epididymitis is certainly painful as well as most of your orchitis like pathologies and so pain less is going to signify more likely a malignant process and and just in general even on the wards if you ever have a patient that has a solid fixed firm mass it's basically testicular cancer until proven and otherwise. Now, the other thing you can look for on physical exam or in a board question is signs of metastasis. And this might push you in the direction of getting imaging more quickly. So if a patient has low back pain, we can associate that with the lymph node that this cancer can metastasize to, right? Retroperitoneal lymph nodes, low back pain, there's an association there. As well as a neck mass, potentially if it metastasizes to the neck, teratomas notoriously can get into the anterior mediastinal region. And then also shortness of breath, if there's lung metastasis, that can certainly predispose to dyspnea and that kind of thing. So let's start off talking about seminomas. So this is the most common type of germ cell tumor. And remember, germ cell tumors are the most common type of testicular tumor. So this is the most common overall tends to peak in incidence around the third year of life. So it's really in our in our major category of the highest incidence when we expect to have a testicular tumor in males. In step two, luckily, there's not as much histology as on step one, but you still have to remember a couple things. So if they describe the histology as round polygonal nuclei or a very prominent nucleolus or the fried egg appearance, that's significant for the seminomatous tumors in general. The fried egg appearance comes from the fact that, again, we have a prominent nucleolus, which is almost like your egg yolk, and then you have clear and watery cytokines cytoplasm around the cell, which is almost like your egg white. And so that's kind of the appearance that you get here. And I apologize, this picture is a little pixelated, but you can see the nucleolus here and you can see that there's this white clear cytoplasm around it. And that's essentially the fried egg appearance to the tumor. Now we haven't talked about a lot of the tumors in females yet, but I'm sure we will. And the dysterminoma is essentially somewhat similar to the seminoma. Finally, the last thing is you can't have elevations in the placental alkaline phosphatase with seminomas as well. Okay, so the yolk sac tumor, it's sometimes also called the endodermal sinus tumor so just make sure you're familiar with both terms now this tumor unlike the seminomas this tumor is going to be found more so in infants and young children in your brain when you get all these options for all these different types of testicular tumors you can just use the epidemiology in a board question to kind of gear you towards which one they're talking about if they're talking about a 30 year old well there's going to be a lot more options on the table but if they're talking about a, a you know an infant it's probably going to be yolk sac tumor or teratoma. And now you just have to figure out which one. The thing that really stands out about the yolk sac tumor is it has these Schiller-Duval bodies on histology. And essentially, the Schiller-Duval bodies, if you see one, it's pathognomonic, game's over, it's this pathology. They essentially resemble a glomerulus. So if you look at it, you can, it looks kind of like a glomerulus. In the center, it has a central capillary with a mesodermal core around it. So you have the mesodermal core around it and a central blood vessel, and that represents the Schiller-Duval body. So if you see that, yolk sac tumor. And in general, the yolk sac tumor i just remember egg yolk again going back to the eggs so yellow white uh mucinous gross appearance and then on immunostaining alpha 1 antitrypsin interestingly enough is in the yolk sac tumor and then like we said this is this particular tumor is just very highly associated with the elevations in afp in general we said non-seminomous tumors tend to be but this particular tumor tends to have the highest association in my opinion with the afp marker in board question okay so choriocarcinoma is a very highly malignant pathology in general and this is when when you're thinking choriocarcinoma you want to think about syncytiotrophoblastic and cytotrophoblastic tissue and remember those are releasing HCG. Because this is a non-seminoma, it can also have some elevations in the AFP potentially, but this particular tumor is notorious for the HCG being released because of the trophoblastic tissue. Now remember that HCG has a component on it that is very similar to LH, FSH, and TSH. And so if it binds to the LH and FSH receptors, it can actually lead to gynecomastia. If it's binding to thyroid stimulating hormone receptors, it can also cause hyperthyroidism or symptoms of hyperthyroidism. You see gynecomast, high blood pressure, sweating, heat intolerance, symptoms of Graves' disease, and that kind of thing in the setting of testicular lesion, you might be suspecting choriocarcinoma. Interesting thing about teratomas is that they're not really age specific. They can occur at any age. Because they can occur at any age, they get grouped into that category with yolk sac tumors, where yolk sac tumors tend to be in infants or young children. Teratomas, because they can occur at any age, can also happen then, but teratomas can also happen in a 40 or 50 year old male as well. So not age specific for teratomas. So teratomas in women are very classic for the cystic type of teratomas in the ovarian tissue or these dermoid cystic type lesions. In general, in females, those tumors that are derived from this type of teratoma tend to be more benign, 
whereas in men, the teratoma it tends to be more malignant. So in the teratoma, because you have all the germ layers, you have ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, you can see muscle tissue, thyroid tissue, teeth, hair, bone. So one way that they classically ask about this is sometimes you'll do imaging and on ultrasound or radiography, you'll see calcifications or the presence of fat in the tumor. So you'll, you'll see other types of tissue in the tumor that doesn't necessarily correspond with what you would expect to see in the testicular anatomy. And so calcifications is classic for teeth. And so that's commonly the way that they ask about this tumor. So teeth growing inside of an ovary or inside of a testicular tumor is classically going to be a teratoma. In women, they tend to be more mature. But in men, in general, these tumors tend to be more malignant because they have more primitive neuroectodermal pathology in general. So and this is more on the malignant side of these testicular tumors in men. So embryonal carcinoma tends to be in that kind of that middle age group, you know, 20 to 30 year old men. And the one interesting thing about this one is it's painful, right? So we said so far that most of the testicular tumors are painless. Embryonal carcinoma tends to be painful and it's much more aggressive than your seminomatous tumors. This one also is very malignant. The other thing I want to say about embryonal carcinoma is the pure embryonal carcinoma has no elevations in AFP and just elevations in HCG. And this is not necessarily consistent with what we've seen with some of the other non-seminomas. In some of the other non-seminomas, we've seen elevations in the AFP, for example, in the yolk sac tumor, that's classic. But if it's a pure embryonal carcinoma, meaning it's not mixed, it's not mixed with a bunch of different types, it's just embryonal carcinoma, then the AFP should be normal and the HCG will be up. Okay, so now let's move to the sex cord stromal tumors. In general, like we said, the sex cord stromal tumors are much more rare and more benign in general. Lytic cell tumor is somewhat not age specific. It doesn't really happen in children quite as much. Usually if it is going to happen in a young adult, it's around, you know, their teen, late teens or early 20s. Now, if it does happen in a young boy, the one thing that can happen is you can end up with precocious puberty because this tumor can produce androgen. So the androgen production can lead to precocious puberty. Androgen and estrogen production will also perform negative feedback on luteinizing hormones. So you'll have decreased levels of luteinizing hormone as well. So in general, the gross morphology on here is going to be more of a golden brown appearance. But the big thing that I want to call your attention to are these uh, ranky crystalloids that you see here. And so these ranky crystalloids are in the testicular tumor, and that's these red kind of uh, cylinder shaped things that you see here. If you see those, they're most likely trying to push you in the direction of a Leydig cell tumor. Okay, so now we have the Sertoli cell tumor, uh, which is also a sex cord stromal tumor, and it's generally benign like we would expect, similar to the Leydig in presentation if it's hormonally active. In some cases, these tumors can be hormonally silent and not release anything. But if it does release estrogens, you can have the gynecomastia. If it releases androgens, you can have precocious puberty in young boys as well. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the uh, last variant that we're going to talk about. It doesn't actually fit into the germ cell or sex cord stromal tumors because it's a lymphoma. Typically, I want you to remember the big thing about this is this tends to be in men over 60 years. So usually in older men, they'll have a non-Hodgkin lymphoma as opposed to the other tumors that we talked about. Now, the classic most common variant of this is the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Interestingly, before we said a lot of these tumors will present unilaterally. In this case, they're frequently bilateral disease and they're also painful due again to the invasive nature of the disease. If we said earlier that embryonal carcinomas are very invasive as well, and so sometimes they'll present painfully, it's the same concept with here. If the disease is invasive and it's attacking uh, nearby structures, then yes, it can, can become painful due to the too rapid increases in size and invasion of nearby structures. And so the other thing too is when we're talking about lymphoma, remember B symptoms, right? Fever, night sweats, weight loss. B symptoms are not classic for any of the other tumors that we really talked about. And remember your B cell markers, particularly CD20 is probably the highest yield one on here to remember. So if they have a CD20 positive tumor, it's most likely going to be non-Hodgkin lymphoma or a diffuse large B cell lymphoma variant of that. And because of the invasive nature of these lymphomas, they have a higher propensity to involve the CNS as well. So older individual, sharp scrotal pain, bilateral disease, you should really be pushed in the direction of a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So we already talked about what we would expect to see in general on physical exam. Remember, there's some exceptions to this painless unilateral swelling in one testicle. In general, that's the physical exam finding you would expect. Initially, we would want to start with a scrotal ultrasound. So the first test you want to do is a scrotal ultrasound, and this will help us evaluate the testicular mass. In a board question, I don't think they're going to go into tremendous detail to describe the ultrasound findings. However, if they talk about calcifications at all, you should immediately be 
thinking it's non seminomatous and it's probably going to they're probably going to go down the road of a teratoma so after you do the scrotal ultrasound let's say that this is a testicular mass that we're concerned about what would we want to do then also want to do chest radiography or chest x-ray to assess for any kind of metastasis so you can see here this is an individual that had a testicular tumor they had a chest x-ray done and now they have diffuse lesions here and we would presume that this is metastasis now if we did the chest x-ray and we're like wow this person's got some abnormalities on chest x-ray or they have evidence of metastasis we would absolutely want to do ct imaging and assess the retroperitoneal lymph nodes to see if the cancer has moved there so for us to stage this cancer after we take the testicle out after we do an orchiectomy and we you know look at the tissue to get to stage two we have to see if the cancer has moved to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes remember this is where the testes are draining retroperitoneal paraaortic lymph nodes and so we have to do imaging to stage this cancer to evaluate what our treatment modality will be based on the stage of the cancer also the ct imaging can also give us evidence of further metastasis to other sites and again our tumor markers that we would generally get are your uh, alpha fetoprotein your hcg and then you can also get ldh as well but again these aren't going to necessarily pin you down on a diagnosis just because one marker is elevated and one isn't. Ultimately, we're still going to probably take the testicle out to know exactly what we're dealing with. So that brings us to the next point in terms of treatment. The answer is always going to be first line radical inguinal orchiectomy. In other words, we're just going to take the testicle out. That's the primary treatment. We have to look at the microscopic findings and this will help dictate further treatment along with staging with CT imaging. And then ultimately, based on the stage that we that we end up at, we might have to do chemotherapy, we might do radiation therapy, we might even have to go into additional surgery. It all depends on how we've staged, staged this disease and where it's metastasized to. In general, though, testicular cancer has a very good prognosis. It's about 95% cure rate with treatment. The most important thing I want you to remember from this slide is the thing that almost everybody gets wrong the first time they get one of these questions. This tumor we kill first and investigate later. Biopsy is not the next best step of a testicular tumor. You take it, the whole tumor out, then you can analyze it pathologically, but you don't do a fine needle aspiration. You don't do a transcrotal biopsy. You take it all out and you diagnose the cancer or tumor or whatever it is based on your findings. The reason that those other options are contraindicated is because we don't want to risk spilling cancer cells and having it spread through the blood vessels and the lymphatics in this particular area based on the architectural anatomy of the testicular region. Storchidism is the primary risk factor. If you're going to remember any of them, that's the one you want to remember. Remember, start with your scrotal ultrasound and then we're going to do radical orchiectomy, take everything out, avoid general biopsies with fine needle aspiration or transcrotal biopsies. Right, We kill first, investigate later. That's kind of the short way, shorthand way of remembering what we do in with this particular type of tumor. And your important images to remember, you have your fried egg appearance, prominent nucleolus, cyto clear cytoplasm with seminomas, your Schiller Duval bodies, classic with your yolk sac tumors, and then you have your Leydig crystalloid structures in the Leydig tumors, which are your sex cord stromal tumors. Okay, so this question is a cumulative question from the whole video series so far. So take a moment, you get five seconds after the thing comes on the screen, and then we'll go through the answer together. Now, let me preface by saying I think this question is pretty difficult because it's tricky. So I, I guess I tried to trick you on this one, but it's from the last video. So no excuses. I'm just kidding. All right. So let's just start looking at what we have going on here. So pretty much the whole beginning of the question stem really has nothing to do with what's going on. So it's just some patient that comes in. He's got allergies. So ultimately we do run some labs just to kind of play it safe. Here we go. He's got this elevation in his calcium level. So this is pretty classic for, for uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. We talked about that. We said sometimes you just get people that are completely asymptomatic. They come in and they have elevations in their calcium and there's no significant derangements in the labs and they're asymptomatic in the sense that they don't have any symptoms from the hypercalcemia. And in those cases, we don't actually treat primary hyperparathyroidism. In some cases we do, in some cases we don't. And we went through all of that in video 190 so check that out if you don't know what I'm talking about. But in any case, here we say, okay, we got an elevation of the calcium. So what do we do? Well, hold on a second. We have to look at the ionized calcium. Remember, we have to correct calcium. Whenever you look at calcium from now on, always correct the calcium before you do anything. So we're given the albumin here and the albumin is 5.1. Okay, so it's still within the reference range. But again, remember your formula, right? Corrected calcium, right? Corrected calcium is the ionized calcium. It is equal to the measured calcium, which is your serum calcium. And then you have this factor here. When the albumin is three, for example, you're going to add 0.8 to your measured calcium. When the albumin is four, right? Then your measured calcium is equal to your ionized calcium. And when the albumin is five, 
right? You're going to put a 5 here. When the albumin is 5, you're going to take away 0.8 from the measured calcium. And that's because of the amount of calcium that's bound to albumin versus how much is ionized. And like I said, we talked about all of this in the last video. So in our case, we have 5.1. So let's just call it 5, right? Just to keep things simple. If we were on a, in an exam, we'd just call it 5. So if it's 5, then we have to subtract 0.8 from the measured calcium. And so that means that our serum calcium is actually about roughly around 9.9. .9. Again, we, we rounded the albumin down, so it might actually be a little bit lower than that, but, but around 9.9 .9 to 10. So right now, the ionized calcium or the corrected calcium is within the normal range, right? We Our corrected calcium adjustment puts us into a normal calcium range, so we don't actually have to do anything. His albumin is just on the higher end of the normal reference range, but we don't have to actually do anything for this person right now. So now the question is asking, which of the following describes the serum electrolyte and hormone levels in this patient? There's no derangements in terms of his electrolytes, right? His calcium is normal. So we would have no reason to expect his parathyroid hormone to be low or high, or phosphorus to be low or high, or the vitamin D to be low or high. We have no reason to suspect any of that because everything is within normal ranges right now. Even though the ser total serum calcium is outside the reference range, when I correct for it, we're okay, we're in a normal reference range. So we have no reason to expect anything less than normal reference range. Let's just go through what the other examples are. So in A, A is an example of primary hyperparathyroidism. We have an increased level of PTH, the calcium we would expect to be high, which it's not in this case, right? We would expect the corrected calcium to be high and the phosphorus would be low because you'd be increasing renal excretion of phosphorus. That's what PTH does. And then the vitamin D would tend to be low, right? Because we're going to have a lot of calcium in the blood. Now, remember, PTH and primary hyperparathyroidism can also be normal in the setting of hypercalcemia. Okay, so the second option, B, is referring to secondary hyperparathyroidism, in which case the calcium would actually be low, which is definitely isn't the case here. The phosphorus would be high, and then you wouldn't be able to hydroxylate as much vitamin D with one alpha hydroxylase, and so that would be low. Option D is referring to a case where if we had like parathyroid hormone-related peptide being released, in which case that would cause the PTH to be low, right, from negative feedback from the hypercalcemia, the low FOS, and then low vitamin D as well because of the hypercalcemia. Finally, E is referring to a case of like sarcoidosis, granulomatous disease, um, or if you have like a lymphoma. In those cases, we have upregulation of 1-alpha hydroxylase, so that's going to cause your very, very high levels of vitamin D, which is going to kick up calcium and phosphorus, right, because vitamin D increases phosphate and calcium reabsorption in the gut, and all that calcium is going to actually inhibit your PTH in general. So I know this question was uh, kind of tricky, but um, you never know what you're going to expect. So hopefully this will help you remember to always correct your calcium. If you guys like the video, feel free to drop a like. If you guys have any feedback about the series or the video in general, drop a comment in the comment section. Subscribe if you're not subscribed so you can see this whole series. And if you want updates on once new videos are released, hit that notification bell. And I also want to say thank you again to the Patreon supporters. Uh, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate your support. And I will see you guys in video 196.